Hi. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Dom. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, I typically make bookish content, movie content, and anything else in between because I like to do whatever I want on this channel and tonight is going to be bookish content. For today's video, we are going to go over the best books I read in the year 2023. I read a total of 92 books last year, which is insane. I've never read that many in one single year. Picking favorites was kind of sort of hard, but not really because I was keeping track of favorites from best to worst, what have you, throughout the year. And I had a great reading year last year, so I had a lot to choose from, but I did single it down to about five. One of my five books is a complete series that I'm counting as one book, and I got a lot to say, so let's jump right into it. I'm going to be talking about these from number five to number one. So at number five, we have that series that I'm counting as one book, and that's going to be Demon Slayer by Koyoharu Gotoje. This manga series is 23 volumes long, and it's about a boy named Tanjiro whose sister Nezuko turns into a demon, so he joins the Demon Slayer corpse in order to find a way to turn her back into a human. I decided to group it all as one book just because for the majority of these volumes, I gave between four to five stars, maybe only like two or three, I gave a three star, and nothing below that. I went into this knowing I was going to really love it, because I really do love the anime. This story is so interesting to me because I've seen plot lines that are similar. It's not original in plot. There's definitely some improvements that could be made plot wise, but I just love the character so much. So even though I've like seen the story before, I still care that it's happening to these characters. What I like about Demon Slayer is our main character Tanjiro. I do love a very emotional character, but like one that's someone who's at one with his emotions because I've noticed in a lot of anime in the past. Like, it, it's like a bad, like, fandoms think it's a bad thing when characters show any sort of emotion that's just not, that's not anger or excitement, but Tanjiro, he's able to cry, and I love a sympathetic main character like that. Not only that too, but he's sympathetic with the demons he kills, but he still understands, he still doesn't excuse all the bad things they've done, and he still understands that they need punishment for their actions. Sometimes I had issues with the author's use of foreshadowing. It either just wasn't there or it was too obvious at times. The few times where she dropped it in a subtle manner. That I really liked. I think she did a really good job with that. And when it comes to the demons and their backstories, because you get a lot of backstories in this series, I think there was a good mix of demons you can sympathize with versus the demons that were just absolutely insane. There was no coming back from where they were at. And I cried for many of them. There was one trope that she used like multiple times, the whole like the loved ones choose to go to hell with the demon. She used it three times and I ate it up every time. I don't care. I think that is beautiful. I love the character designs of this series and quite frankly I do like the art style. A lot of people, the big complaint, if there's complaints about the art style, it's mostly just how sloppy it looks, especially near the end when the author was getting sick. So at some point it's like, can you really blame her? But I actually really like the sloppy art style. I felt like it enhanced some of those character designs that I love so much. My only gripe with this series is that so I feel like now that I've completed it, something needed to have happened between the Swordsmith Village arc and the Hashira training arc, because I feel like we just jumped to the last bit of stuff way too fast. Like just something more needed to be there to develop the story itself. But again, at the end of the day, this made my top five of 2023. I was an emotional wreck when it was over. I cried multiple times. I love these characters so much and I'm going to miss them. And honestly, another reason I'm putting it so high on the list is just because I'm actually proud of myself for accomplishing this. I didn't think I was going to finish the series in 2023, but I ran through a lot of volumes in November and December to make it possible. At number four in this list, which I gave five out of five stars, so all the rest of these books have five out of five star ratings, is The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. This takes place in a fantasy world where a group of humans are sacrificing a baby every year because a mean evil witch takes them and eats them but leaves the town alone. However, you find out that the witch is actually really nice and she doesn't understand why these babies are being abandoned. So she saves the babies, gives them star power, and adopts them out. This happens once a year. In one year, there's a little baby that she decides to name Luna because she accidentally gives Luna moon power, which is extremely powerful, and she adopts Luna herself. And it's just adventures from there, Luna learning how to live with all these other towns and get along, what's happening in her birth town and the politics behind that. This is one of those books where I gave five out of five stars to, but I, I'm not really sure why. Like, I don't know what it was that I loved about it so much compared to other books. I mean, obviously this book is going to have the generic critique all my other books that I love have. For example, this has great 
world building. The synopsis I gave you I feel like was kind of convoluted and especially because there's just so much more to this story. But despite the intricacies of this plotline and all the fantasy elements in the story, it was actually simplified a lot better than what I'm telling you. The author did a great job with that and it, and it, it felt very contained. This story is definitely more about the journey than the end. It was, it was very cozy and everything works out so well in the end that it felt like maybe this is why I gave it five out of five stars. It just, the story felt like a big hug. My thoughts could essentially be summarized as a great cozy fantasy that you could use for a bedtime story that I wish I myself have written. I feel like my thoughts on this book are so generic and there's other books I've described as such and I only gave those books three out of five stars or four out of five but I, I don't know I just I couldn't get myself to give this anything less than five out of five. Again maybe it is because like I said it feels like a great hug but I really enjoyed this. If you can if you guys can get your hands on this I highly recommend it. At number three we have Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale. Hurston. This is about a black woman named Janie and this story spans throughout decades of her life. The main reason this made number three on this list was just because of how personal this story felt. It was told in patois or a dialect and for me when stories, movies, books, whatever have a dialect or they're spoken in another language it, it somehow makes the characters feel more personal. I think it really enhances who they are as a person. It really enhances their identity which is a huge huge theme of this book because it's about a woman trying to find herself and trying to gain her independence and figure out who she is. Another reason this story feels so personal is because it's more so slice of life, meaning that it's definitely more about the characterization than it is a plot. I was truly amazed by Janie's journey and seeing her grow as a person because this story starts out with her as a young child and eventually I think it ends with her in her 50s, 60s, definitely as an older woman. She's one of those characters where like her core values and who she is deep down stays the same but at the same time she is changing in other ways. She has three husbands throughout the story. They all are widely different people but at some point each person, even the ones I particularly hated, were important to her at a certain time and why she somewhat needed these men in her life. And the explanations for why they were needed were great. Like they were needed, were they quite literally needed because of financial reasons or just because they were a certain outlet she was looking for, like a certain companion she needed. I really like that Janie was able to make choices for herself even if I didn't agree with them and I like the themes that this book was exploring. I think it did a great job exploring the themes of racism and identity and what it's like being a black woman of the South because those things are really important to who Janie is as a person. And this book also had some beautiful imagery especially at the end there and not only imagery but just the way her emotions were described. Like I felt like I just felt so close and connected to Janie and I was sad when I finished the book because that meant I had to put her back on the shelf. I'm really glad I was able to read it this year and thank you to Olivia Savannah over at Olivia's Catastrophe for gifting it to me in Christmas 2022. My dog is staring at me from his little cocoon on the futon. But at number two we have a horror novel and that is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. This is about four men who are part of the Blackfoot tribe and they are being haunted by elk. This is a very eerie story, which is what I was looking for. My favorite types of horror are more so eerie rather than the ones with jump scares and gore and just trying to like actually terrify you. And not only was this eerie, but it was able to keep that mood throughout the entire book, which I find highly impressive. Not only were the four men of this book being watched at all times, but it also felt like someone was watching me like over my shoulder. I really enjoyed how the backstory of what happened to these characters was handled because I sometimes with horror, they tend to like info dump, but I didn't really find that to be the case at all. Yes there is a specific chapter that like delved deep into what happened but it did that after throwing bits and pieces of what happened at us throughout the story. So the chapter wasn't being used to info dump and start from the beginning. If anything it was used to connect those pieces. And thinking about it that's probably what helped keep the eeriness throughout the story. In the end the reason I'm putting this at number two on this list is because it's a very simple revenge story that's also about breaking cycles and it didn't try to be more extravagant than it needed to be. Sometimes Sometimes a simple story is what works best. And at number one I actually have a nonfiction book that I read very earlier in the year. Like 2023 was a whirlwind so this is one of those books where it's like I can't believe I read this in 2023 but I did. And that is Go Down Together The True Untold Story of Bonnie and Clyde by Jeff Gwynn. If you don't know who Bonnie and Clyde are they were pretty infamous bandits here in the states back in like the late 20s early 30s. I feel like to this day there's a misconception about Bonnie and Clyde that they were these mass 
masterminds of criminals. And I, I mean, I fell for it too. And I'll get to that because that's one of the reasons this book is number one. But media back then during their day and even like a future movie made them out to be bigger than they actually were. That going into this book was almost like a jump scare because it just absolutely wasn't anything like what I was expecting when reading it. Literally the reason this book is number one on this list is that it took my perception of something and turned it upside down. Bonnie and Clyde were not the mastermind criminals I thought they were. They were actually just two kids, essentially, because they're even younger than I am now, and I'm 26. And they were terrible at their jobs of being criminals. And I just think that's kind of hilarious, especially because of how we think of them today. They weren't bank robbers constantly performing heists. They were carjackers. They would steal cars and go steal at grocery stores, because that's all they could do. In this book, I basically learned that they were two people who really had no idea what they were doing. And that's kind of funny to me. Like, I love a good story about a terrible criminal who wants to be a mastermind so badly but no matter what they do they can't achieve that. This book delves deep into their histories like it even goes back to the when their parents were kids and on the Philadelphia Discord I remember talking about this with someone he said he has read multiple books on Bonnie and Clyde. He read this one this year per my recommendation and he said this is actually one of the most comprehensive books he's ever read about them. So if you're a huge history buff this is the book for you. You learn so many of the minute details that I would never have thought to learn about. I learned that my girl Bonnie is the whole reason these two are famous. You know I'm not saying I'm supporting when women do bad things but I am supporting the empowerment of women or whatever Lady Gaga said. I don't believe in the glorification of murder. I do believe in the empowerment of women. But on a serious note, this book, because of the amount of detail in this book, I felt like I really got to know Bonnie and Clyde just as people. Like, I mean, yeah, they were real people, so I mean that literally, but also just because sometimes when you read history books or when you learn about historical figures, they still, they, they feel like characters, if that makes sense, but they didn't feel like characters to me reading this. They felt like real people. I could have maybe like come across in life if I lived back then. When I found out how they died and how that situation was handled, I actually felt really bad for them. And I know they did bad things, but I'm just, I'm sad that that's, that's the way they had to go. And most importantly, because it's a nonfiction book, this book makes me want to travel. I want to go see, I want to go to Las Vegas so I can see their car and just see the other places in the states they visited. And it makes me want to learn more. So yeah, a lot of reasons this book is number one, but it was also just really fun. And I just, I remember, so I retained, I'm still retaining a lot of information from this book. Sometimes when I read nonfiction, like, yes, it's interesting in the moment, but like months later, it's like, I don't remember what I read. Whereas this one, it, it really stuck with me because of how fun and fascinating and interesting I found these people to be. And that is it for this video. Let me know down below any thoughts you guys have. If you're interested in reading these books, if you have read these books, tell me what your thoughts are. And also tell me what your best books of 2023 were. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up, comment, subscribe. Y'all know the drill. Without further ado, I'm going to peace out and I'll see you guys later. Ciao, tutti.